So today, the wonderful Nick Shukla is joining me, and we're waiting for him to join. Easy, bro. All right, how's it going? Good, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm... Nice, 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 nice. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I am in conversation in my Drunken Chat series with my beautiful friend, Nick Shukla. Now, if you don't know, Nick Shukla is a famous esteemed writer um, and an old dear friend of mine. Um, so we're just going to talk utter nonsense at each other. Hi, yes. Hi. Hi, yes. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, all right. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, just experiment with new camera angles and stuff. Do you know what I mean? Experiment. Yeah. This is the thing about lockdown. The bar opens earlier and earlier every single day, man. It's very true. It's very true. Can you hear the background music, by the way? I'm, I'm trying to block it out. <laughs> so, like I said, Nick S. Shukla, dear friend of mine. We've, we've known each other for years. I'm trying to think when we first met was maybe, what, 2003, 2004? So around then, yeah. I think yeah. One, one of the infamous Shiva Sound System warehouse parties. Yeah, full mm. raving times. And Nick Esh has is, is since become this esteemed writer. But before that, he had a, a secret identity, uh, a secret hidden past of being a rapper. <laughs> a, a very mediocre rapper. Well, still a, rap, a rapper nonetheless. And it was, uh, you know, that was that was quite a good sort of uh, a, a little bit of a pathway. And then a folk singer and then an author. Yeah, something like that. It's, it's not been it's not been the most traditional of careers. I don't think Will Self ever cut his teeth at Kung Fu and, and the underworld and um, on a Saturday, a Saturday night or whatever it was. Well, there you go. That is true. That is true. I don't know what Will Self was doing, but I, I know I've, I've obviously known you for a very long time and followed your career. But the critical thing is that through all of this, there was this point where you started writing books and Jacob on the comments is just saying Coconut Unlimited. And Coconut Unlimited was your first novel, right? Which was about you being a rapper and a yeah. brown rapper. So not, not a rapper that's like intrinsically connected to hip hop uh, and its origins as you normally would be, but as, you know, a brown kid from Northwest London. Yeah, it was a book about, like, it was a book that was sort of po poking fun at my own sense of authenticity that, like, my my sense of identity in this sort of really, really serious, heavily white school that I went to was to be really into political rap. And that's how I was going to keep it real. But, like, half the time, I didn't know what the hell they were on about. Like, the first public enemy song I ever heard, they were going on about Harry Allen. And I was like, who's Harry Allen? I don't know who Harry Allen is, but... It just felt like an important part of my identity. Like, comics and rap, that's been, like, the through line through everything I've ever done. Yeah. And being brown, of course. I mean, have, have I always been brown? <laughs> I think you've always yeah. been brown. You've always talked about being brown as well. Yeah, I guess. I mean, shit, your first book was called Coconut Unlimited, which, for, for the uninitiated, is like a slur against um, brown people that happen to have a certain anglicised nature and therefore they are white on the outside. So, like, equally, uh, Bounty works. Uh, so does Chalk Ice. So that's what Coconut Unlimited was all about, was you being... A Chalk Ice. A Chalk Ice. Yes. Yeah. And the yeah. inverse of that, of course, is tea bag, right? What, like, um, like an Eat, Pray, Love type of person? Yeah, kind of someone that's indophilic. Someone that's just, like, totally down with the brown. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's probably, like, the nicest... That's the nicest term that I've heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's that. But I want to know, right? So I, I know, I obviously know. So you did Coconut Limited. Then you did Meat Space, right? And um, you did a bit of a stunt. You put, you, you sent a lamb chop into space, uh, like uh, a proper halal lamb chop covered in spices and stuff. And you sent it into orbit around the Earth, um, which was quite a fucking good stunt, I've got to say. Thank you. That I is pretty it, awesome. I saw it up all by myself. Um, it was like it was like one of those classic pub chats that kind of just escalated to the point where my mate Nick, who who you know, just went home and and did the research and he was like, actually, it's not as hard as you think. So yeah, like my second novel was called Meat Space, and as a little stunt, we decided to send. I just sort of idly said, why don't we? Uh, and Luca's comment is, you can do all kinds of things by yourself. Amazing. She's the vet. She's there to troll. Um, exactly. Yeah. Hi, Anushka, yeah. by the way. Thank you. 
Yeah, um, yeah we, I just sort of idly said, what happened? What would happen if you if we sent a bit of meat to space? Yeah. And Nick went away and researched it. And you like, can do all sorts of stuff yeah. with your own meat as well. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yes, indeed. but we didn't we didn't just send any lamb chop into space, man. Yeah, it was a Thayab's lamb chop, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, so for those that are uninitiated, Thayab's is a Pakistani restaurant in East London, round the back, round the round the back of East London Mosque, that did for the longest time the best lamb chops that you could get. Hold on, hold on. You're saying this like it's in the past tense. That I mean, is, it's it's uh, fucking quarantine. Nothing's open now. <laughs> yeah, what okay, are you talking sorry. about? Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course it's in the past tense. Are you have you been to Thayab's recently and had a bit of a munch? Yeah, I don't think so, bro. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we we drove we drove this Tayab's lamb chop into in uh, to to like the countryside to a place called Little Slaughter or Upper Slaughter somewhere in the in the Cotswolds, and uh, oh my god, this is controversial. People are slaying the Tayab's lamb chop. In no the way. Lahore kitchen. Listen. <laughs> I mean, Lahore kebab is actually pretty fucking good, rather right? up the road from it. To be fair, there is that. But you know, they, they were the original. You've got to give. You've got to give thanks to the originators, right? Well, I mean, you know, they're, they're, like honestly, the amount of drunken nights I've been like on that stretch and bounced from my preference from Lahore to um, to Nido. Or I don't Nido. know about Nidus, man. I don't know about Nidus. Like Bupi, our dear friend Bupi is is all about Nidus, but I, I'm not feeling Nidus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I live in Bristol now. I, I'm, I'm not getting any lamb chops. There's a lot of things that are. You, listen, you've become. You, I know for a fact you've become a sourdough wanker. <laughs> yeah, I've become a sourdough wanker. You're like fucking talk about coconut unlimited, bruv. You've gone from lamb chops, sending lamb chops into fucking space, to making sourdough bread for your street. I mean, talk about a sellout. But speaking of selling out, right? Let's just one thing I wanted to get at was there's this one book that completely changed everything, which was obviously. The Good Immigrant, right? So you went from what? writing novels uh, about the good immigrant, <laughs> the good flimmigrant, the fla the flanimals, the same author as <laughs> the flanimals did the good flimmigrant. Yes. No. So the good immigrant. Um, <laughs> that, so you went from writing novels about being brown to doing a book with a bunch of brown people that suddenly became fucking massive. Uh, yeah, I did The Brown Book. And the like, Brown I'm, Book. Yeah. And now I don't have to do any more. Um, That's the, I mean, come on, every fucking book you've done since has been about brown people. Look, they all star brown people, but it's not. Okay. okay. Fair enough, fair enough. But yeah, yeah there's, look, there's, I, you know, there's an interesting talk quote. About that. Like, there's a, uh, someone called Bolu Bubblona said an interesting thing once, um, where she was like, I don't want to watch TV shows about um, being black. I want to watch shows about black, uh, black people being and I think that's kind of what I'm trying to do at the moment is like stretch the canon of like what we get to do on screen and on pages and stuff. And that's kind of what the last, the books that I've done since The Good Immigrant have um, been about. But yeah, like The Good Immigrant was just like, if, if I'd known that it would have turned into this thing at the time, I probably would have thought about it a lot more seriously. But it all just sort of happened like just like well organic. But yeah, organically, like naturalistically, like I think some of the, sometimes the best projects are the ones that you you kind of just don't know what they're going to be and you don't have any expectations and then they just kind of take on a life of their own, you know? Yeah. And that's, I mean, so Good Immigrant was a collection of essays with lots of, you know, we've got some mutual friends on there. You obviously wrote something and a bunch of other esteemed writers of colour wrote stuff about it and it became this huge phenomenon. Um, and that kind of made you uh, sort of like the brown writer person so anyone that talks about writing and brown people go to you yeah it's weird because that i think the problem with the creative industries is there's like there's a little bit of like highlander syndrome going on like there can be only one and and i know it's a bit like it's a bit like a radio one if it was me and d and bobby in the hole it's just like right which one's going to be the darky yeah. Yeah, which which double team up is gonna is gonna beat the other one up? Um, the but yeah, the that's why like after the game like people constantly came to me for stuff, and I was like, you know, there are other people. Like I was being asked to like comment on issues that were specific to like the black Brit like specific to the black British community, and I was like, well, why aren't you asking people who are black British? And 
like people in the media were like, we literally don't know anyone. And so I was like, well, okay, here's like 10, 15 names that you could ask. We like, don't know anyone. Like fucking get some mates, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like actually get more brown and black mates and then you can ask them. I mean, that's the irony because if, if you ever said that's kind of racist, they'd go, how dare you call me racist? Some of my best friends are black. And you'd be like, well, why didn't you ask them to comment on this thing then? Dude, exactly. Caught, caught Dude, the there was this one time, you know, honestly, there was this one thing where when uh, D and I were on Radio 1 and I was doing a bunch of shit, I had hold to on, go... hold on. Just, just to respond to Agent SSS, I ha I have been asked multiple times. Who's Agent SSS? Well, I don't what? know. But you just said tell us about Windrush, and like, I have been asked multiple times. To go on. Are you saying different comments to me, bro? I was asked to go on different news news channels to talk about what was going on with the Windrush, and I had to be right. like, you know, you should be asking someone who's from the Black Caribbean community, and they were like, um, okay, who should we ask? And I was like, okay, so let me just do your fucking job for you you know yeah, uh, yeah it's it's people are so lazy that's that's what you realize and, th yeah. and that's why that's why they make you the only one is because they're lazy because you've had a thing that that they they can go oh yeah he did that thing yeah you are the brand person so you are there for the brand talking head there was like i was saying i, I kind of feel that because there was this moment when when because you know, we toured India so much with Shiva Sound Systems, the DNI, go to Bombay every year, we tour India, we do our thing, come back and then do Radio 1. So it was like suddenly, you know, we, or I became the authority on India. So when Slumdog Millionaire came out, Millionaire, oh uh, shit, actually, there, there's a pin in that, R.I.P. Irfan. Yeah, sure. Irfan Rest Irfan. in peace, Irfan, um, who's had way better, bigger roles than that, of course. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I was asked to, comment on the ethics of Slumdog Millionaire because I was brown and went to Bombay. I was like, really, <laughs> mate? Like, the fuck's that going to do with anything? Um, so that was kind of fun. But again, you know, like being the only one Highlander style does have its perks um, because then you get asked to comment about everything brown. But having said that, I've got to, I've got to, I'm going to completely like drag you over the coals here, bro, is that current politics around the world uh, to do with immigration have come to a head in many, many countries. You know, we've got, there's issues in America, there's Indi issues in India, there's issues in England. But yeah. the one, the one sort of, the, the sort of biggest revelation from that has come from you in the fact that you fancy Pretty Patel. <laughs> I can't believe you did. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is randomly said one night should never be made by so what is it about Pretty Patel that you fancy the most? I think that she... And Pretty Patel, I just want to clarify, people watching internationally, Pretty Patel is kind of our uh, uh, a high-achieving brown uh, lady who is in charge of foreign things, and she just hates foreign people. And basically, Nikesh fancies her. The, you know what, like, the, the, there's this, what I really hate about her and Sajid and Dishi Rishi is, like, the bar for representation is set so low at the moment. Um, and I think, I think people, I think people are quite happy with any sort of representation being, like, the end goal. And it's just made me think a lot recently that, Yes, it's all great that Pretty Patel is, Pretty Patel and Sajid and, like, all these people are holding position of power but like what good does that serve their communities if they're actively acting against them dude i totally agree with you but let's go back to you fancying her <laughs> Complete your what the fuck is this come on tell me tell me what you fancy about pretty patel nothing absolutely nothing I mean... lies you said it was a cheekbone <laughs> come on don't give me this shit like come on talk about your your stockholm syndrome um affections <laughs> it's that smile it's the smile <laughs> see, uh, see, Ad Ad Bal, how do you spell it? Ad, uh, look, man, I'm never saying anything to you. We want to know. That's what we want. I mean, everyone's saying, yeah. Anyway, um, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, this is the point. So these these interviews are all basically me getting drunk on my mates and talking shit to them. And so, in that, with that respect, like you know. Nick Ash is an esteemed author. He's done through all this thing. He's got weird taste uh, in terms of his personal fetishes. His family are beautiful. So, and that there's no overlap there. Thank the Lord and the maker and um, the programmer. Uh, but the one thing that we do share is our love of comic books. 
and Nick has just wrote an article for The Guardian Ooh. about Spider-Man. <laughs> Onto safer ground. <laughs> Onto safer things, yeah, man. Spider-Man, yeah. come on. Let's go. I mean, Spider-Man is all over my office, man. You can see, see a little Miss Marvel there as well. Uh, shout out to Fisher K. Ali, who's writing the TV show. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. The the one place that we're now. I can't believe I go on to save ground and you lose fucking anything to say about that. That's know, ridiculous. Know, it's just, it's just the reliefs washed over you that I'm not going to fucking gun you about how much you sort of have your pretty Patel wall on the other side of your office that no one's allowed to see. You better take your camera one way, like Spider Man. The other side is a fucking wall of you, like pretty Patel. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> Spider Man, like he he was just he was just the the, the classic teenager who. Um, can get shit together, and guess what? Uh, we've we've all been classic teenagers who can get this shit together. So I mean, I know you've always been like, oh, I like Batman, very dark, very dark Batman. Well, there's very white. Dark. Look, there's Batman there, and then there's a Batman there. there. Yeah, go on. And on, and, on, and on the other side, there's a Ben Affleck's, like just a picture of Ben Affleck's entire back tattoo. Um, I'm convinced that bat tattoo is not real. Do you know what? Fuck you, right? Just because Spider Man has like an Indian incarnation in 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 Brifter Prabhkar doesn't mean there isn't some like Bukhinder beam out there that could be like the Indian Batman. Fuck you, dude. Just because DC haven't been sort of you know just because it's got that white patch here, you're racist. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Batman is definitely that Batman would definitely be a rich brown Tory. Okay. That is fucking true. He would, wouldn't he? No, no, but yeah. That is he's, like a, he's like a management consultant for Accenture who went like through now. <laughs> Shit. That is true. But you know what? There is, there, you, you did mention your friend who's working on the Ms. Marvel um, TV series. So Ms. Marvel is a character um, from Marvel Comics called Kamala Khan. And she's Pakistani-American uh, young teenage girl. She wears like uh, she's kind of hijabi in it. No, she's not hijabi. She wears, at least wears a scarf, at least, anyway. Um, so as a character, she's just fucking every sort of thing that you'd imagine America to hate. But it was one of the biggest selling comic books when it came out because it's so yeah. well written. It's brilliant. Uh, it's so good. Yeah, and Marvel is developing a TV show about it. Um, and Nikesh's friend is one of the writers, right? Yeah, she's showrunning it, which is fucking amazing. Hell. Yeah. And that's a brown woman running a Marvel TV series. Yeah, about 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 a brown girl lead. Yeah, uh, Bisha, <laughs> Bisha K. Ali. Sorry, sorry, it's not, like, it's not Miss K. Marvel. Ali it's Miss Marvel. Booting like, Miss, Miss Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> a brown Miss Marvel. <laughs> Fucking up. Gritty reboot of Miss Marvel. <laughs> That's proper jokes. <laughs> but yeah, so Bisha's doing it, right? Yeah, yeah. I um, I know nothing about it. I I keep I keep like I'm so close. Always. Inches away from asking her whenever we're texting, but part of me is like, I've got to respect the NDA. I already do. So you know what? As as being a fellow geek, right? So Nick Ash is a massive geek. I'm a total fucking geek. Um, and our dear friend Riz was in Star Wars Rogue One, uh, and in Venom. And I don't know about you, Riz, but I, I mean Riz and uh, Nick Ash. I couldn't speak to him about shit. I couldn't. He wouldn't reveal anything about anything to me. Yeah. Yeah. Me neither. I remember like being like, please can I come and be, just hang out on the Venom set? And he was like, really? You'd fly halfway around the world for that? I was like, yeah, I would. <laughs> yeah, right. I totally would. Right. I like fucking, yeah. Even, that, even though Venom was a bit whatever, still your mates in it. So yeah. I remember actually, we, you, you and I had this really in-depth, hushed conversation about whether, beg your pardon, where, whether Venom was going to be connected to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, and I, Riz wouldn't say shit. It was really annoying. Yeah, I, I still reckon that they will. It will happen at some point. Of course it will. Of course it's going to happen. But again, like the geekness, you know, it's it's very rarely satis very rarely satisfied with the people we know. Everyone's sort of so um, respectful of the NDAs. It's really annoying. Yeah, I I I broke my NDA that I signed when I went for a meeting at Marvel Studios while I was still in the building. <laughs> well, so you took pictures while you were in the Marvel Studios? <laughs> took pictures instead. I think I sent them to you. Fuck you, you did. You did, you did. But there was and, you were, yeah. and you were like, when was that? I'm like, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still waiting for 
<laughs> Hi, Frisha. Frisha's waving. Dear friend from Bombay. Yeah, that's it's messed up. Do you know what? Actually, there's one there's one avenue, right? Which I think, in terms of geek um, nailings, that I want to do is um, because of Nitin Nitin Sawney and his his his, his best friend Andy Circus, right? So he's directing Venom 2, and he's fucking Alfred Electric in the new Batman film. Electric Boogaloo. I mean, yeah, that's a deep reference for, for a lot of other people. But yeah, but Andy's also going to be Alfred in Batman. Is he? The Batman. Yeah. The Batman. Yeah, I mean, he's that's, Alfred. That is, uh, considering how many times Batman's been re rebooted, that's a cocky move to call it the Batman. It's not just but Batman. You know, it's but the... you know why? You know no, why? I'm, no, I'm being... You know why? Like, in Batman's first appearance, he was called The Batman, so... Yeah, I know, I'm being stupid. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, listen, anyone watching the whole, like, people are dipping in and out because this isn't very musical-related, it's more literary. But if anyone's got any questions, hit the little question mark button and ask Nikesh whatever you want. Or me, in fact. But, yeah, we can talk about geekdom, we can talk about writing, about music. And, in fact, speaking of music, let's get into this, this, do, do um, this. this album. What? Do you recognise that? The White Rubik's Cube. Yeah. That's from Doctor Who. No, from Spider Verse. Oh shit! That's um, that's Nick Cage's Spider Man's. Um... Yeah. Wait, what's your connection with the Spider Verse again? Uh, my my friend's husband uh, was one of the directors, and she sent it to me. Dude, how do you not have more like insight than anyone else about geek shit like this? Because I, I play it called Bide My Time and Get the Merch. I'm quite jealous. Spider-Verse was excellent. Do you know, are they doing Spider-Verse uh, Spider 2? I think so. I, I I can't remember if it was announced. I feel like it might be a Spider-Gwen thing. I feel like I read somewhere. I don't know. That would be cool. Mm, I'm not so sure. I would, I would even go so far as to say is that number one. That's the best Spider-Man. Spider I think so. When is the next Yam Boy album coming out? <laughs> uh, never. Absolutely never. I mean, it is, and you know what? It is such a joke that Vinny, of all people, asked that, having never released anything, having never finished anything himself. That's not true. We released, Shiva Sound System released his first thing uh, in 2005. Six, seven. What, on, on one of the mixtapes? Yeah, yeah, on India One. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's never finished, like, a, an album. I've, I've... No. no. So anyway, <laughs> stop deflecting these questions. Number one, I asked you about your fancy and pretty Patel and you fucking bang on about immigration policy. Number two, is like, <laughs> when's the Yamboy album coming out? And you're, like, deflecting. Come on. This no, is no. fucking question time. Like, come on, answer the things. So, uh, never. You know, I, <laughs> I went back in the studio last year I went back in the studio, I recorded something with, with uh, one of our friends, and uh, I didn't hear from him for a while. Who? Uh, with Sarathi, and, um, and I, I think what happened was, he was, you know the last track on, on More Arriving, mm -hmm. it's quite loose, that poetic, narrated poem thing. I think he was expecting me to come in and do something like that. But I just came in, and I suddenly like, felt the beat and I just wanted to rap again and I rapped and I think he was a bit like we should have stuck to the original plan <laughs> so ain't no young boy things coming out no man I'm like 40 you know what's um <laughs> I get it. What? no one wants to hear like a 40 year old fat political rapper shouting <laughs> have you have you not heard Puffin's new stuff of course they do yeah but Puffin's actually good there's, there's a difference also <laughs> Puffin Puffin didn't stop doing it for the last 20, 20, 25 years, you know what I mean? I took like a 10 year break. No, no one wants to... And then became an author. Yeah, no, no one's sitting there going, when's the album coming out? Except Vinny, but I feel like he's asking me to make fun of me. I don't think so, I think it's genuine. I mean, I, actually, I would say, when's your next folk album coming out? Because there's a lot of, okay, so, Nikesh wrote this folk album um, years ago, that's just amazing. It's some of the, the sort of most it was raw, Huh? It wasn't that good. I basically recorded it in three months when I was in Kenya. Yeah, it's rubbish, but it's brilliantly rubbish. Like, it's, to it's so shit, but it's brilliantly shit. I love it. I think it's the most punk thing entirely. And it's one of the best things that I've ever heard. I think it's amazing. <laughs> I, I, really, I really like that there's a lo-fi scene in 
New York called Anti Folk, which is like people with like really scuzzy, beaten up guitars, just sort of sort of sing rapping over the top of them and like just using the same two or three chords. And I really loved that stuff because um, it was always it was always really nerdy and really like comic book inflected. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was sort of going for while I was just sitting in a flat in Kenya for a year. Yeah. Which is quite, I mean, you record this whole album. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's so bad. It's beautiful. It's, so bad. it's amazing. I think it's just so good. I, I just love like trolling you with this album, but it's so good. Is it going to, are you going to actually put it on Spotify or something? So people can hear this. <laughs> no. Oh, wait, so I've got gold here. Right, I might just release it on Shiva's I mean, hands system for the fun of it. I've got like a thousand CDs that I was never able to ship. <laughs> so people are asking to turn it up. Right, I'm going to play this. No, I'm, I'm just going to scream over the top of it. I don't want to be a pirate. This is amazing. It sounds weird. I don't want to be a pirate. So want a floating address. So bad. Okay, you know what I'm going to do, actually? There's one song that I love, right? And I'm not sure how this will damage your career or not. Actually, maybe I shouldn't play it. <laughs> no, maybe I shouldn't play it. But it's got the best chorus ever. And you know what, actually? I'm going to play, I'm going to play one song, right? <laughs> Please don't. Oh, come on, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's not Indian Ed Sheeran. That's hilarious. Right. <laughs> now, this is quite a lovely song, though. When's the last time you heard this album? <laughs> Probably like the week after I got all the CDs and was like, I'm never selling this. <laughs> Check this out. Stop and search. Oh, okay. Stop and search. Protect and blue. Cavity search if you're easily amused. Amazing. <laughs> now this is the chorus. It's amazing. If only your policemen were cuddly, they wouldn't arrest me with a biddy. Like a biddy is like an Indian cigarette. It's amazing. <laughs> It's one of the, it's some of the best shit ever written, bro. I'm not even i I'm not even trolling. I think it's fucking brilliant. It's like the most punk shit ever. It's amazing. Shit. It's so shit, man. It's amazing. That like, is proper good, bro. I think you should own this shit and do a second album. You know what? If Vinny produced it, it. Mate, you've said that and Vinny's just said you you know, you asked for beats, but you know, it wasn't happening. And, and he never sent them. Ah, uh, well there you go. There is some, there Send is me some, some beats, Billy, and I will make them sound terrible. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Jam's like, yeah. Jam, I did love, lovely to see you on this thing. It's very good. So there's another track that's on this album, which I think sums up Nikesh perfectly. It's called Super Heroic. And I played this as well. And it's just, it's just so beautiful. And this is basically a playback session where I watch Nikesh, where we could all watch Nikesh cringe. Yeah. It's like some hurdy gurdy like business. I'm just, I feel like I'm just gonna go on my laptop and um, <laughs> Why are you doing this? Oh god, this person needs to buy. Oh my god, I've never typed this email. Oh, I'm so sorry I didn't get back to you. I think it's beautiful, bro. I think it's awesome. Dude, this has to come out, man. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it to the world. The world, oh, mate. Hey, Simon's here. Easy, bro. But yeah, so there's this whole folk album. There's a lot of geekery, but there's also a lot of success, right? So you've done all of this shit. You've done an amazing, like you've become this stereotypical Highlander voice for brown people and minorities everywhere. And um, how do you stay so humble and just not <laughs> become a massive prick? Well, I have friends like you <laughs> to remind me of times when I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, life's a bitch, right? It's just like Bleh. yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think I choose my friends on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rena's here from New York. Hi, Rena. Hi, Rena. I'm sorry, man. And Simon's here. Yo, yo. Yeah, 
So, um, you like Prince, huh? How about that? Well, I mean, Prince is an excellent songwriter and an excellent poet, but not as good as you, bro. <laughs> I mean, Prince has only published one book in his entire career, and you've published several, so, you know. I know, what a slacker. What a slacker he was. It's crazy. I mean, that's that. Sometimes it snows in April. Does it? Does it really, Prince? Does it, it does. It fucking snowed like two or three times every April when he passed. That's that's actually probably not the most egregious lyric that that, I've ever, that I've, his, that I've ever heard. He did. He are you one of are you one of those Prince fans who who like likes absolutely everything regardless of when he did it, how, what version it was. No, man, I'm, I'm a critical Prince fan. I'm someone that can sort of, you know, assess his body of work. Hi, Nirmika, how are you? I'm, uh, I can assess his body of work and then pick and choose for sure. Yeah, thank God, there was a good, there was a good 10 years when... Uh... Sugno's just saying, actually, that line's excellent. I took a bubble bath with my pants on and all the fighting stopped. I wish I'd done it sooner. That's amazing. But yeah, sorry, bro, you were saying, sorry, I cut you off there. I can't remember what I was saying. A good 10 years of guff that Prince did. Yeah, he did a good 10 years of guff. Yeah, proper. But so, there were like gems within that, you know. So like, when I, when I said we should do this, I was like, I, I wanted to interview you because I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Okay. Tell me about your first clubbing experience, Nam. I'm, I'm intrigued at, as to how you fell into this life, this sort of DJ, DJing in dark rooms life. Fucking hell. First, what, first ever clubbing experience? First ever clubbing experience. Hmm. I'm trying to think. Um, fuck, no one's ever asked me that. I have no idea. I think it must have been sort of sneaking. I, actually, no, it started off with metal gigs. So I was like a massive death metal fan. So I'd sneak out to death metal gigs in Birmingham and Wolverhampton and Dudley. Big up the Wolverhampton, Wolfram and Civic. Big up Dudley, Dudley JBs, um, and seeing all these bands and shit when I was a kid. So I'd like, you know, I basically, I remember blackmailing my mom when I was like 15 and saying, either I go to a rave and come home at four, or I go to a metal gig and come home at 11. You make the choice. <laughs> so I completely just fucking like, like steamrolled her into letting me go to metal gigs. So I, looked, I saw like bands like Slayer, um, Machine Head, Biohazard, Obituary, Napalm Death. Like, it was fucking ridiculous. And then the transition point came when there was, ah, I can tell you exactly, thanks for this, um, was a band called Living Colour, which was the first ever time I saw black people playing rock music, which was quite a fucking revelation to me. Because, like, you know, growing up in Birmingham, um, musically, in terms of weird, skinny, uh, or weird-looking, skinny, beige role models, there was only Prince. And seeing that live was an impossibility. And then Living Colour came out with their album Stain, uh, which was just fucking brilliant. And then uh, they did a record signing at Virgin Megastore in Birmingham. And I was in my school uniform when I was 15. I was like, right, I'm going to go get my record signed. And I got it signed. And then I saw this dude in like this T-shirt and he had lots of lanyards. And I said, um, and, and I was like, I wanted to. And I was like, look, I'm too young to buy a ticket for the gig tonight. Um, and he put me on the guest list. It was my first ever fucking blag. Oh man, that's amazing. Yeah, so I blagged it in to that when I was 15 and saw them play a venue called The Hummingbird in, in Birmingham, which had live gigs and turned into a rave afterwards. And I went and saw them on my own because I was obviously a long-haired, fucking buck-toothed, braced, spotty geek um, and then stayed for the rave. And that's what that just triggered everything. It was like, yeah, everything from there. Yeah. And, how, and then, w what point did you meet Hearth from Charge? Oh fuck, Charge. Okay, so that was that was another weird one. So that was years later. I became a DJ in the sort of mid to late nineties, um, and was in that whole sort of underground music circuit in Birmingham. And then there was while well, you were still at school, right, or college, right? This is like kind of college vibes. Uh, and then. I was quite the dancer. I used to go out and give it some and wear full makeup and, and all sorts of, you know, weird clothes and stuff. Um, and it was kind of like from, from a really impoverished upbringing, well, not impoverished, but a really humble upbringing um, to suddenly finding expression in drum and bass and the gay house scene 
it was kind of like in Birmingham particularly, it was like, okay, let's jump into this where you can express yourself fully. Um, so I used to go out to these clubs and dance my fucking ass off. And then somehow I fell into the breakdancing crew. And the way I used to breakdance was very unique. And I used to throw in some like Buranathia <laughs> moves and shit. And people were like, I know it's bizarre thinking of this creaking old body now, but I used to be a dancer. And so one of the breakdancers that I used to battle and then used to represent with, um, called Mouse, Big Up Mouse, um, was like, dude, there's this band called Charge that you need to meet. And that's how it happened. So it was, it was a weird thing. It wasn't through the Asian underground thing or any sort of Birmingham Brown connection. It was through breakdancing on the whole drum and bass and underground hip hop scene oh, in me. Birmingham. It's fucked up. It's really weird, man. Like, totally weird. Yeah, Simon, big up my Simon was fucking there. Simon was there through all this shit. It's just insane. It's quite a, a mad trajectory. So yeah, Harv uh, founded a band called Charged, which then um, was an electronic punk band that was covered in like lots of music press in the late '90s, early noughties, and yeah. Yeah, I remember. I remember reading about you guys in the NME when in like '98 or '99 or something like that. Like it was 2000, oh, 2000, 2000, I think maybe 2001. Okay. Yeah, like not long after Community Music had come out. Yeah, and like being Asian was like just on the on the downward swing of being cool. You know that's remember that summer, that one summer once when we were cool. Uh, yeah, we changed my like, life. Not not touchings. It was very good. <laughs> not touchings. Yeah, yeah. Man. I, I remember. I actually do remember when you and I met. It was the first ever Supersonic Buddha, because like I'd been watching you guys from afar and coming to the raves and like coming to warehouse parties and stuff but that first supersonic buddha we actually we actually had a drink together um there I was, mean, like, was I, 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 don't, I don't mean to put an anushka shankar on you and forget about our first ever meeting because this is what she does she just forgets about everything but the point is i don't remember that because i think we had lots and lots of drinks with lots, yeah, and lots yeah. of people yeah i was one of many people yeah, yeah we drink that night. um there was yeah i, I feel like there was a band with like a violinist and Renu Hussein. That was Shiva Sound System Live, man. Yeah, that was the yeah, that yeah. was the that was the like the the third version of Shiva Sound System Live, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was it was a really great night. I, I, I met Mira. First. It was like really at Vibe Bar. Yeah, yeah, I remember it well. Fuck, I don't remember any of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> It's very fun. easy aria, easy Vin. Yeah, I don't remember actually. Oh, yeah. So Vin's asking, do you remember the track we made together? Yeah, yeah. He and I started working on a track, but um, I think my my recording setup was so bad that I just sent him really crappy vocals for years. Huh? But um, yeah, yeah. It was such a good beat, such a good beat. Um, Dundaka Forest. It was called, named by our friend Kunal. Ha! Huh? Love Kunal. Big love, good enough. Shit, man, it's we've all come a long way since those days, eh? That's insane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Supersonic Buddha was quite something. It was our club night. And in fact, Kanal did that Ganesh portrait right behind me. And that work over there is the first work that Kanal ever did for Shiva Sound System, which was um, Kali, Kali stomping on a clubber. And it was projected at our warehouse Halloween party, which is why it's framed, because it was the first ever work we did together. Kanal, culture shop India, gangster. Yeah, I've I've yeah, got man. I've got various bits of things around around here as well. He's such, such a legend. Yeah, various bits as in like sort of castings of his genitalia or <laughs> just uh, <laughs> just his glasses. That I no, his, yeah, he leaves his fucking glasses everywhere. That guy. Yeah, yeah, he's still wandering around like unable to see properly because I've got his glasses. I mean, yeah, that's not the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> The rumors, the rumors are true. You can't, you can do it too much. Yeah, you totally can. Yeah, <laughs> going back through the touchings properly. Actually, yeah, that's a good point. How have you been coping with, uh, with like lockdown? Has your wanking quota gone down or gone up? Uh, I, I'm the, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a dad of two, two kids, man. <laughs> so the wanking quota is through the roof at this point. Yeah, okay. I'm just, I'm just lucky if I make it till to nine thirty without having had some sort of weekend about how tired I am. Fair enough. Yeah, it's all right, man. I think Scott, squeezing in your touchings between like like lessons is quite hard as well. <laughs> I guess there's a certain amount of guilt and like and like sort of gear shifting that really fucks with you. 
Yeah, well, as as I was saying, <laughs> as I was saying to you and a couple of other friends, you've got you've got to zone the flat. You've got to zone your flat out. Otherwise, otherwise everything just um, just molds into one thing, and you haven't left. Yeah. And your bed is your office, and your kitchen, and where you sleep, and where you go, where you uh, go incognito on your web browser. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was this one, actually, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal some more horrible shit, but I remember this one very vivid image that you gave me, which was like, I think the neighbours caught me sneaking into my toilet with my iPad. And they saw you through the window, and they're just like, yeah, just like drawing the curtains with my iPad under my arm. Like, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't me, man. Ready to do some self-care. I'm that sure it was you. That definitely wasn't me. <laughs> I don't have an iPad. <laughs> Ari, is, Ari is saying this is so wholesome it, it totally is I mean that, again welcome to these conversations it's all about just the dirt it's lovely and by the way if you've just if you're just sort of clicking in or clicking in that sounds so shit if you're tapping in to this chat you miss Nikesh talking about his um, fantasies about Pretty Patel so <laughs> Jesus Christ <laughs> um, yeah so you were a du you were a you were a backup dancer for charge. I was the, I was I was the Indian Bez basically. So Indian Bez from the Happy Mondays. I got my, all my mates Simon and everyone called me like Asian Bez, Asian Bez Foundation. That was my thing. So I was a fucking Bez, dancer. Bez in the yeah exactly. Bez in the Bez in the yeah. And then um, well, what point did you form Shiva Sound System? To well, okay, so it's a weird thing because I was DJing anyway through all of it was in charge. I feel like I feel like all of your, your career stories start with. It was a weird thing, but um Yeah, they, but all of it is I mean you can fucking in fact you you can attest to this, right? Is that all the sort of points that of your life that are fucking massive are just random. Yeah, They're yeah, so please. weird, right? So yeah. the point where, you know, I started DJing, was in a band called Charge, we did really well, and then suddenly Shiver Sound System happened, then the radio stuff and then soundtracks and fucking whatever. All of it's just really weird and and just happens. Yeah. But the but the purpose of sort of saying that, you know, us darkies and us brown people can do something different is always at the core. So all of that shit doesn't really matter. It's always about like what the fucking reason is, right? And you know this. It's exactly what you've done. Yeah. You know, it's exactly what you've done. You've you've changed the whole fucking publishing industry for minorities um full stop just by saying, Well, why can't we challenge it? It's the same shit. Yeah, it's, it's, but that, yeah, that's what I was trying to say about when we did the Get Immigrant Market. I, if I'd planned any of it, if I'd thought... It would fuck up immediately. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, it was yeah. the other thing about, um, about the, when the lamb chop, the lamb chop thing, because it was such a mission to get the video back for various reasons. Because it was we, in fucking space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, we had to wait until it went a full orbit around the Earth. No, but when we, because it, it, in fact, it landed in a field and it just took, took us ages to find it. But by the time we got it, our spirits were so low because it had been about five months that we'd been looking for this bloody camera. That we just put it out because we were like, you know what, let's just, let's just do it. But when we sent it off, we were like, this is going to be the biggest thing on the internet, man. But by the time we then released it, it wasn't. And yeah. then it was like, for two whole days, it was the biggest thing on the internet, which is amazing. Like, yeah. When I think about like career highlights, being made fun of by Paul Merton on Have I Got News For You, because he cannot for the life of him comprehend why any dickhead would want to send a damn to space. Uh, it's fucking marketing, isn't it? Yeah. It works. Yeah. Easy, yeah. Todd. How's it going, bro? Todd from New York. And Rena, family, wicked. But yeah, no, exactly that. So it's all a fucking accident. So like Charged was an accident. Um, transitioning, forming Shiver Sound System was a fucking accident. All of it, complete accidents, man. Constantly. I mean, did you did you just set it up so you could like you could be the you could host parties rather than have to? You know what? Honestly, right? It was a case of like, okay, so be growing up in Birmingham and being quite solitary and being from like a humble background and being not an alpha male was kind of difficult and being brown and from like a humble background, like I mentioned before, was all quite tough. Um, Are you from a humble background then? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but having said that, <laughs> it was weird, man, because Birmingham had a lot of weird frictions about fucking caste, religion, all sorts of shit. You know what I mean? Like, um, I often say that I got, I got beaten up by brown people at home, 
uh, black people on the way to school and white people at school. So I had like a rainbow of cunts. Uh, it was brilliant. So it's led to like zero racism on my part of like being picked on by any, you know, any sort of um, situation. Maybe I was the problem. Maybe I was just a, a very, very, very good target. Vin says nothing's changed. It's true. Um, but yeah, you know, but, but from that um, came uh, a healthy uh, fuck you and a healthy punk approach to everything. You know, yeah. so uh, and that's and like I said, the golden threads that run through every single like work situation or anything really is that punk approach to things. You know, so yeah, I think I think having um, <laughs> yeah having that approach to everything's really helped, and also been a massive hindrance as well. <laughs> they still want to be you, aren't they? <laughs> it's true, but now I can dodge a little bit and I can sort of deflect. There's some skills. But yeah, there was no, you know, exactly that. It, it was just like, and you know this, it was just about sort of proving that, or not even proving to anyone else, but just existence was a fucking struggle. And doing that on your own terms was was a miracle. So I'm very, very thankful for that. Well, yeah, there's this, there's this quote, uh, this Zadie Smith quote that I think about a lot, um, where she, she said she, she wanted to take term, take words like black and woman and stretch them until they felt comfortable enough for her to live live in. Right. And I think I think I think about that a lot in terms of like what it is to be brown. And so starting with a book like No this, shit, Sherlock. I mean you don't you don't cover the brown thing at all, do you? No, but like stretching that so like it's not just um arranged marriage, jihadi, eating a yeah, yeah. fiction, you know. Um, and uh, you know that's that's important to me. So like, I do write about brown people, but like I, I'm tr I'm constantly trying to make them complicated and nuanced, and like people that you and I actually know and grew up with. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So it's relevant, but I think also there's something about I mean that that's that's dealing with the reality a bit. But I think there's something to be said for the aspirational aspect. So why can't you do this? Why can't you know fucking brown people do? something else you know what i mean yeah exactly exactly a, yeah. This, this was like the fun thing about uh, getting this honorary doctorate uh, <laughs> yeah because i got to be basically fuck you dude you had two honorary doctorates i, I know there's one and two and fuck you bastard he's a doctor so his parents are yeah. fine but dad's happy with it you know what i mean yeah i got to basically stand on stage in front of an entire student body and go brown brown kids tell your parents you can be a doctor and pursue a career in the arts I am proof, and yeah, and it, you know, someone said to me like, because because I know like academics are a bit a bit sniffy about honorary doctorates and like people who call themselves immediately start referring to themselves as Doctor Shukla because they got an honorary doctorate. But actually, I was, part of me was like, you know what? If I can if I can be visibly Doctor Shukla and still be doing my thing, then that's going to inspire people, so that we yeah. don't have, we don't have to have these conversations. Do you know what? You and I get that, and I get that from you about the inspirational factor, but I think there is this fucking line that I personally feel, not about you or anyone we know personally right now, but this line of like where that that whole thing of like, yeah, I'm going to be an inspirational figure, then leads you to be an asshole. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'm an inspiration, I'm doing this, and therefore I will act like a cunt. It's like, oh, fuck off. Come on. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, this is it's just not so... This is why I'm lucky to have friends like you, man. To keep, keep me humble. <laughs> Just like, mate, stop being a dickhead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It, 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 is, it is a fine line, man. Like, let's... I, I, I mean, personally, my whole thing is just like, you know, if you stick a brown flag in something, it kind of... That's it. It yeah. doesn't really have anything beyond that. And you've, I think you've navigated that really well, man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Hey, look at this mutual dick-sucking we're doing. Very good. <laughs> So, um, have you have you rewatched Rise of Skywalker yet? Yes, I love Rise of Skywalker. I, mean, I, I have no problems with it. I have, I have no I have, problems with Rise of Skywalker at all. Looking, I love it. I'm looking forward to rewatching it next week when it drops on uh, the old Disney Plus. Mate, fuck off! You and I had a massive <laughs> issue with Iron Man Two. Like, I can turn off bits of my brain and just enjoy it. Yeah, but I'm, I'm a dick like that. I mean, yeah. It's you know what it's basically like me listening to um, to like I don't know a uh, what's that guy's name a Stevie Oki set or something and I'm obviously going to be fucking critical. 
Yeah. So yeah, so you with writing. In fact, how the hell do you enjoy anything you watch anymore? Because you're a critical writing bastard. So then you're just like, ah, oh, well, that could have been this and that. You must really fucking like not enjoy watching or reading anything anymore. I mean, it's it's a hard thing when you can kind of you can see hogs that are turning. They're they're um, one of my creative writing students where, where I'm teaching. He kind of came in one day looking a bit glum, and he was, I don't understand how, how I don't understand you, man. I, I feel like you can't enjoy anything anymore. So what? He was like seeing him watching something with his wife, and then he started talking about like some plot structural plot problems, and she was just yeah. like, enjoy the fucking thing. What is wrong with you? And, it, and and I think that's just me. That's just me ch channeled through his mouth. And like, See, it was a problem. You know what? It's interesting because I know I've known you for a very long time and I know that there's some shit we're not allowed to talk about publicly, so I'm going to keep that aside. But there's some shit that's already happened that is fucking rubbish that you've done, right? Yeah. In terms of plot and structure. And one of them was Kabadasses, right? Yeah. So right. Kabadasses was like a, a, an idea that was brilliant in theory but it was kind of pants it was executed really badly you know there was, there was so many lessons learned from that and just, just to clarify kabadasses was a pilot for a sitcom about kabaddi 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 so i had this i had a good idea but it was like it was classic um it just it just it just what got away from me i remember i remember a friend of mine saying You've you've lost control of this to me, and I was so adamant, I was so angry that he said that I was like, no, I haven't, no, I haven't. Um, but like the thing about it was my first thing I was doing in TV, and TV is very collaborative. And the thing about the collaboration is like, unless you, as the writer who had the original vision, are party to those conversations, it just gets away from, further and further away from you. Yeah. And to the point where like. The more we rewrote the script and rewrote the script and rewrote the script, we kept cutting out scenes of Kabaddi. And I was like, we've got a pilot for a show about Kabaddi that has Kabaddi in it. Like, I don't get it. Because um, like, my original idea was basically Scott Pilgrim versus the world, but set amongst the, it's set in the Kabaddi. Yeah. But the closer and closer we got to it, it became like a shit version of Only Fools and Horses or something. I don't know. Like, it just didn't work. Yeah. Um, which was which was a shame, but like I, I learned a lot from that that experience. And uh, the thing that I learned was like, your instincts are good. Yeah. And, and you know, like when you're when you're walking into a space where people like you haven't walked into, like your biggest fear is that if you speak up, if you prove yourself to be like the opinionated ethnic, then people are going to take it away from you. And so I constantly, I just up in, in loads of meetings, don't say anything, even though I disagreed with a lot of stuff because. Everyone just bluffed like they knew better. And actually, it was my show. I'd come up with the idea. So yeah, like, you don't want to rock the boat and, boat and fuck it up, right? That's the other thing. Yeah, it's so, the fear of that, right? So I'm really guided about it. But then, like, when, a couple of years later, I got to do a short film uh, with my boy Sam Masood um, for Two Doses, where, like, I was much, you know, I was much more forthright about what I wanted. And, like, between between us we came up with a thing that kind of resembled a good collaboration between us rather than me just writing a script turning it in and shutting the fuck up and yeah i think like and so like i think i think now i've probably gone too far the other way where i'm too opinionated but i think <laughs> that that chip has just taken over yeah yeah like yeah this isn't a face it's now a full potato um no shit sherlock okay you need a wide angle yeah. lens i know i know i need to stand further <laughs> back like, fill that fish eye, you know what I'm saying, bro? And that isn't a, that isn't a reference to, like, you know, juiciality. I feel like I'm way too close to the camera. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. 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 Nice. Well, that's the other thing, is that it's, I think there's that, there's that issue of getting to a certain level in those infrastructures with the idea you want and keeping that idea fucking intact is really, really fucking hard. Yeah, it's it's it, you're always making compromises in TV, and uh, and the thing is you don't have to, but mm. people people need to people need to make the show. So if you're not giving them the, the direction they need, they'll just go and make what they um, what they think the show will look like. You know. Yeah. I mean, I did a. Like, so a essentially, the answer to this whole conversation is that you can be critical of everything you watch, including your own stuff, which you know is shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I hate myself so much. I'm like, I think this is why we're friends. I think there's got to be uh, there's this thing about sort of hating your own catalogue of work and fucking like challenging yourself that makes you know makes you you. If you're like someone that's like, yeah, everything I did was perfect. I shat golden eggs at every point. You're an idiot. The thing is, so like Oscar Wilde. Hi, Shreya. Hi. About to get very like unnecessarily highbrow. But Oscar Wilde said, novels are never finished, they're only ever abandoned. And I would say that for most most creative endeavours, most works of art. At some point, you have to stop tinkering and just release it. And the thing is, once it comes out, whether it's a mixtape or a record or a book or a film or whatever, like, the second it comes out, it belongs to readers or it belongs to viewers or it belongs to listeners. It doesn't belong to you anymore. Unless you're George Lucas and you can go back in time and think of shit. <laughs> Unless you're George Lucas. In which case, I, I mean, you and I have this long running, running argument that I really long to just see the the cut of Star Wars that I watched when I was like eight years old. Uh, and you're Dude, like, I've got it. I've got it. But I wish they would digitise that rather than digitise it with new effects. Yeah, but I, I mean, like, I have, through my surreptitious connections, I have uh, the original 35 millimeter transfer. Really? Yeah, you know I do. Of course I do. I'm a fucking Star Wars nerd. Of course I've got it. Screen that shit. Screen that shit. Yeah, I mean, I'll give it to you. You can screen it for yourself. But I don't think that Fox, sorry, Disney will, will do that again. Yeah, I mean, that's what I miss about it. I think... I, I think the, the By the more... way, we're going to get booted in three minutes, I reckon. I think if we're, if we're, if we're having an, a long-running argument about stuff, I think that's to get booted out. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Hi, Mita. How are you? Uh, but yeah, I reckon, um, because I also need to pee as well. Should we call this or do you want to reconvene? Let's call this, man. I'm going to go and get another beer. Okay, fair enough. You don't want to get a beer and come back? All right. I'll meet you back in two minutes. Mm. All right. See you back in two minutes. Two minutes. <clears throat> Hi. Hi Nadia, how are you? Nikesh, is here already. Hi, Izzy, how's it going, Izzy? You alright, love? Right. We're waiting for Nikesh, my esteemed friend, Nikesh. Hello, love. I'm going to stand a bit further back this time. Nice. You got your multiple chins in frame. Thanks, man. My leg's good, Nadia. Thank you. Yeah, I'm good. I'm just, yeah. All's well, Nadia. Thank you. Hi, Izzy. Hi, Rena. Yeah, all's well. So, yeah, do you get a beer, Nick? Yeah. Actually, also, I want to clarify that no one's allowed to call him Nick apart from me, apparently. You and Inwa Ellum's dad. And your dad calls you Nick? Yeah. That's kind of sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So we've now got a. What have you moved on to now? I don't know. I had some thoughts, but yeah, you tell me. Come on. Hi, Mr. No. What, are you, what are you drinking? So I ran out of JD. I'm now on Hague Club, which is like fucking Beckham's whiskey, which I only discovered after the fact that I actually enjoy it. <laughs> really bad. I've had to shift recently from like full fat Coke, Coca Cola. Uh, to zero sugar coke. Hi, much to 2017. Hi. Uh, yeah, I've had to shift to like zero sugar stuff because I I discovered that out of everything, the sugar's the one that gets me a bit wrapped up. You know? I think that's just. I think you're just getting old, man. <laughs> Your system of processing sugar. I reckon. I mean, have you had a diabetes test? Yeah, it 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 is a blight on our community. You should get yourself tested. You know what? In all honesty, um, I I have been trying to put on weight for fucking ever and i've been trying to eat and 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 shit and it's like throwing shit against the wall and seeing something like stick and nothing sticks no. i mean you must feel a lot of pity towards me yeah i mean you can borrow some of my body weight yeah lock, lockdown is not been kind to the to the sugar waistline 
D that's that's a fucking lyric. See, you you are still a rapper, bro. <laughs> you are still so Nikkei Shukla, esteemed writer, esteemed fucking author, award winning, like <laughs> beacon. Of pre I'm reading, producing you, fuckface. Uh, like esteemed author, esteemed like icon for brown people all over the world, and Dokla expert. Yeah, I start making my own. Is what is that? Fuck off, really? How? Uh, with packet packet mix, my mum would not be happy. Imagine. Are you using like Eno's powder and stuff? Sorry? Eno powder. Yeah. So tell me, tell me your Dokla recipe. Um, you pour, you get the packet that you buy from Indian <laughs> Sons, you pour it into a bowl, you mix it with water, then you steam it. That's pretty much it. No Eno's powder. Like, when do you add the Eno powder, man? I think that's if you're making it from scratch, but I'm not making it from scratch. You need okay. a... Is it Janadal? I thought Janadal. It... I thought it was um, semolina, but what do I know? I'm an idiot. Actually, fuck that. I'm going to look that shit up right now. What is the flower in Dokla? Yes, you are joining uh, Googling Things with Nerm. <laughs> Googling where, Things um, with me and you watching. That's what it is. Yeah, we're doing a watch along when um, Google's Google things. <laughs> Dude, that's fucking great. Actually, it'd be kind of dangerous, too. If the search history <laughs> came up on the screen, that'd be really bad. <laughs> Actually, what is it? It's a uh, gram flour. That's not chana. That's not chana kata. That's different. Gram flour is chippy flour. It is. Yeah. Fuck! I'm such a coconut. <laughs> I thought I was. You no, know, all my you all my life. You don't use coconut flour. You use gram flour. Fuck you, dude. Chippy. Like I always thought that gram flour was like a whole other um, like legume that had a name called Gram or some shit. Like, the <laughs> translation was mis like mistaken. Holy shit, do you reckon drug dealers use Gram flour? I mean, with jokes like that, it's, it's a shame you're not a dad. Like, I, I think you know, I, I was, I've become peak dad at the moment. Okay. Where, whenever I go to, go to do the big shop, which is already a peak dad thing to do. Like, I've got like a, a boatload of stuff. Um, I always say without fail, to the person, she, they're ringing it through, and I always go, I "Only came in there for bananas," <laughs> and and they always give me like, "You are so embarrassed." If you were my dad, I would die right now. Look, it's brilliant. I, 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 the thing is, I can't stop. I know it's coming, and I know it's going to come out, and I just can't stop. Mate, I mean, there's 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 uh, a whole issue I have with dad jokes, which is the fact that I have no children. And therefore, I am a faux pas. <laughs> I'm so glad people have joined us. Don't <laughs> Google things and uh, This is true. Right. So, where were we last time? Before we, we, we uh, are you doing any more t-shirts? Well, good print t-shirts. Uh, oh yeah, fuck. So, just to clarify, this who we're talking to right now is Nick Shukla, the editor of the Good Immigrant, who's a fucking gangster and has changed the landscape of publishing for people of color across the world. Uh, that's who we're talking to. And we've chosen to sort of take this time to discuss utter bollocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of Instagram lives and they've all been like talking about my career. This has been you dragging me <laughs> and me like going, hey, no, let's try and turn the tables on you for a change. Um, yeah, uh, the, in terms of t-shirts, I did a, I did a run of t-shirt, a good immigrant t-shirts to raise money for women for ref, uh, for refugee women a couple of years ago. And the thing that I discovered is when you don't have a merch store and you're just um, selling your own merch, it's a pain in the in the ass. So you basically got a corner shop with no stock. You're a fucking idiot. Is the I, so when we when I was doing the journal, um, I, I took like three boxes of the mail out to my local post office and the guy the guy in the post office looked looked at it all of it and looked at me and he said just said in Gujarati he didn't know me I'm like I'd not met him before he said to me in Gujarati he said is this all yours I was like I answered him in Gujarati I was like yeah and he said, what do you mean you went okay sorry so you went you went ha in Gujarati yeah yeah and um and he said D is this your business and I said yeah, and he said, "What are you What are you doing?" I said, oh, "I'm selling selling books." He said, "If this is your business, you can't be doing very well. You you need to you need to be paying other people to do this. You should, if you run the company." And I was like, "Are you my dad? What is going on?" 
And he was like, you bring people to take things to the post office. Why are you doing it? What's wrong with you? And I was like, I hate this, this infection so much. Dude, there's this, there's this, but there is, a, there is a weird disconnect with certain people. So there's a very, 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 in fact, you know this story. We're not going to name this person at all. But there's a very, 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 very famous writer that we both know who I met up with and we had this chat and um, it was like, oh, so, you know, DJing's good for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you know, music's good for you. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, so when are you going to open your club? I was like, dude, it's a whole fucking other business. It's such a, an old school idea of like, well, if you're a writer, then you must have a publishing house or you must like do your own thing. Yeah. It's so weird. Yeah. But that's also like a peak dad comment as well. That's when, kind of what I mean. When, you, when are you going to turn this into a, into a business? Into an actual business. When are you <laughs> going to make some money for the heart? Yeah. yeah. And, when, and the answer is never satisfactory, which is if I turn this into an actual business, it would not be fun. And actually, I would... bro, actually, bro, fuck you, because you know what you've done? You've got the ultimate get out clause, which is like, I'll get an honorary doctorate and tell my dad to shut the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, was, that was my career trajectory. I was like, just aim for an honorary doctorate and then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> now, I can, I can actually just rebel. I can, I, can, I can start fucking up now. Yeah, because you're a doctor. And, and also on a flight, when they go, is there a doctor on the plane? You can go, yes, me. And you'll be <laughs> I, fucking useless still. Yeah, I have prepared this haiku about the choking gentleman. There you go. What is the... Oh, Joe... You're bringing the pain. Um, I have been trying to teach my kids jokes. Um, not, and I've been trying to teach them the knock knock, who's there? The interrupting cow, the interrupting. Mm. Yeah. And they, oh, it's so frustrating that they just cannot tell it right. They wait for you to say interrupting cow who, and then they shout moo, and they fall on the floor laughing. And you're like, guys. This is this is terrible. This is terrible comment. This is not. You're missing the point of the joke. What's wrong with you? It's really frustrating. See, a true artist doesn't blame his blame his tools. Are you calling my daughter's tools? <laughs> yeah, no, this is a shit director is what you are. And that's my point. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a terrible script, first of all. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's many, many, many problems with this, but your daughters are not two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the worst dad joke in my arsenal? I mean, Nerma's got. A lot of um stop deflecting <laughs> fucking stop deflecting you political fuck right number one you fancy a pretty patel you won't talk about it number two your rap career you won't talk about it and number three your dad jokes you're deflecting fuck you answer okay um i think oh god all right uh did you hear about the constipated accountant he worked it out with a pencil. But a bum That's that's excellent. I'm gonna steal that and make it better. Like all DJs do. You take it and remix it and make it better. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna play my tune, basically. I've been playing your shit. I know, so So throughout this whole fucking thing, this is Nick Eshipler's folk album. Yeah, it was I can't, I, I can't believe I trusted you with a copy of this. Dude, there's a whole... I've got so many, many demos, it's fine. Of, of lots of our friends, so it's fine. I might just put it out on, uh, on Bandcamp. Le leak the hard drive. <laughs> Nerm's, um, Nerm's retirement fund. Dude, actually, there is something there. I know there's a there's a couple of there's a couple of things that you might be able to make a bit of money on. I mean, fuck my photo my photo library alone would be kind of salacious. <laughs> It'd be scandalous, yeah. All right, so are we done? <laughs> oh, I guess so. Are you done? I'm done. I've got I've got nothing now. No more questions. Nothing else. You don't ask me anything else. Okay. What is your dance floor filler? Oh, fuck off. Yeah. No. There you go. There's a question. Um, Joe, it was a dumb joke that uh, uh, Nerm and I made on a night out and he is now dragging me through the coals. It's not true. You like her cheekbones. You're <laughs> properly, properly, like, all happy about Pretty Patel's face. It was, um, 
it was a, a messy night. The next day, I was not myself. Fair um, enough. Um, yeah, my agent Nish is asking about my my pull up Tekken. Well, I have no Tekken. This is why I'm forcing myself. Nerm has has this like pull up bar thing that I saw at his, his house like ten years ago, and like I bought it in like ten years, and it's just been lying here. And I finally decided I need to I need to justify this thing in my house. So uh, this is why this has become my lockdown battle to do one chin up. Nice. Hey, I mean, you're winning. Depending on your viewpoint. It's not, un it's not unyielding thirst, Joe. This was... Um... No, you're such a bastard. <laughs> I mean, yeah, dude, fuck you. You said, can I ask you a question? You said yes. I mean, what do you expect? I mean, for fuck's sake. <laughs> I mean, okay, so here's one thing I want to talk about. So when Nikesh and I saw Avengers together, he got a whole fucking crew together to watch Avengers Endgame. And I turned up mega late because I went out drinking with Simon the night before. And I was a fucking state. And I sort of careered into the cinema just as it started. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was a moment. It was amazing. What I love about that morning was you were, you'd not long gone to bed when we woke up like six, seven in the morning. And the message we left you was, Gamora has your ticket. <laughs> and you, it was, turn up, you turn up in the cinema, like, not quite right. And so this was, this was, this was someone actually, who was, who was this 6.30, 6.30, no, 7, 7 in the morning? Seven, something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, at, 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 in Leicester Square for the, for the Avengers Endgame fucking first screening. And uh, the message was, Gamora has your ticket. So I ran in and literally Gamora was there. And she had yeah. your ticket. And she had my ticket, but she was just like, I, was like, I ran up to her like, do you have my ticket? And she was like, who are you? I was like, my friend sent me this message. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was beautiful, man. I'd, um, I'd, I'd basically done a tin, uh, like a tin foil pack of, of parata for everyone. Like, like every Gujarati family should just did our trip. But also Methi Paratha, right? So yeah, it was yeah. Methi. So everyone fucking stunk. Yeah. Yeah. No, you weren't even sitting with us. So you knew and I could fucking <laughs> smell you a few rows back. I literally fucking went in. Like, Avengers Endgame's on. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the and combination of... And you like, yeah. Mummy? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It was that and the stench from your belly button combined. So it was more like, ha, ah, Nikesh. They are and the It was like, button. yeah. Yeah, um, I you know, crying on the shoulder of Nish Kumar, who is also crying. <laughs> it was a beautiful. It was a beautiful morning. We were we were all very very emotional and we very tired as well. Yeah. Um, I but I remember I remember your you shrieked when um, when when Cap picks up the picks up the hammer. It was you fucking didn't. It was amazing. But I could hear you above everyone else. It was amazing. Honestly, as like as as a DC fan, like I love Batman. I'm a fucking you know big DC fucking fan. Marvel has smashed it out of the park with their cinematic universe, and I kind of uh, I kind of prayed for something as poignant from the characters that I love, and then Joker happened, and it kind of fucks you up in a whole other way. Yeah. So it's like it was like Cat getting the hammer was like, yay! And then there's the Joker, and like, fucking, like, I want to kill myself. But it was still just as impactful. You know what I mean? It was like this whole other... And I think that kind of typifies the distinction between the two companies. Yeah. One's really morose and one's really fun. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, it's not surprising that I like the more morose shit, I guess. Yeah. I just, and I just want to have fun. Yeah. Uh, I'm about to run out of battery, so... Mm. So we'll call it. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Big love. Thank, and I'll, thank you. I'll no doubt chat shit to you in reality soon. Yeah. Thanks very much. Love you. Love you. And thanks for everyone to watch. Uh, to watch. Thanks for everyone that watched. Bye. Thank, thanks for everyone to watch.